Hi. My name is Wayne Maris. And for those of you who've been with us over the last um, two days, welcome back to our conversation as part of our research project, Taking Care. For those of you who um, are here for the first time, I will um, just give a brief introduction. Taking Care is a collaborative project um, with um, among 12 ethnographic and world cultures museum across Europe and one organizational thinking partner, um, Culture Lab, that tries to bring together two contemporary anxieties. On the one hand, we are interested to think again, to rethink about planetary and climatic futures and the anxiety around the Anthropocene, thinking critically around the term Anthropocene and what is at stake in the use of such a term for many people for whom that term hides um, centuries of colonialism, centuries of precarity that colonialism created, but also centuries of resilience and refusal in the face of colonialism. On the other hand, we wanted to bring together this question of climatic futures together with the questions about plural futures and the struggles right now across Europe to live in plural democracies. One could suggest the struggles across the world where anxieties about others, the other, who the other is, that person from outside has been rising in the kind of xenophobic politics that we've seen become almost normalized in the present. Taking Care was written together by these 12 museums and our partner culture lab several years ago. And at the time of its writing, we were never aware of the prescience of what was at stake in the project. At that time, we were never yet aware of COVID-19 and what that pandemic would do for us to try and think again about our relationships to each other as well as to the planet. We were never aware at the time of rising global anti-racist mobilization that happened recently in the afterlife of or in the wake of um, the killing of George Floyd in the US in May. So this project is inserted within that political domain to ask the question, what might the ethnographic and world cultures museums do in an attempt to fight these two ghosts of the colonial past, in an attempt to fashion other more equitable, just and livable futures for both humans and more than humans you know, planetary, in planet today. I want to, this is an invitation to you all to participate in this discussion, which is not just a discussion for today. It is a discussion that the Taking Care group will be doing over the next three years. And we hope that you will join us in these conversations. Urgent to it is our attempt to refigure the ethnographic museum to a space of care caring for objects, caring for people, caring for the planet. And that is the question that we want to ask for ourselves. Now, one, before I introduce our speakers today, and they join an erudite group of speakers that we had yesterday and the day before, artists and scholars, including several indigenous scholars. I want to just apologize in a gesture of laughter to suggest that to say I'm sorry that you're seeing me so often, but I'm, I'm the face. I feel that I'm getting tired of talking myself. So hopefully you will bear with me and not be too irritated by my presence, but hopefully that I can stimulate us to think together as an invitation into a, in a common project of asking these questions. Today, we're going to have Neil Martin and he is an assistant professor in the Department of Literary and Cultural Analysis and coordinator of the Research Masters in Cultural Analysis 
after completing com uh, an um, ASC from the PhD in 2012, he was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship at the um, ACGS to work on the project entitled London's Demons, Noise in the Global City. This research is incorporated in his book, with, um, in his book, Ian Sinclair, Noise, Neoliberalism, and the Matter of London. Neil is currently working on a project entitled Noise Work, Reading Globalization Through Noise, which extends his earlier research on noise to examine the different ways in which concepts of noise interact with and produce our ideas of globalization. Neil will take us into our first encounter with the concept of endangerment, thinking with also a secondary concept, but important concept of extinction, a concept that is urgent for us in Ethnographic Museum today. Neil, I turn over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Wayne. Uh, I just want to ch check my audio is okay. Yes, it is. Your audio is okay. Okay, yeah. that's good. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, let me begin by saying a big thank you to uh, to Alessandra and to Juliet and to Wayne uh, for putting on such an ambitious event under such difficult circumstances. Uh, but also for the care and skill you've shown in calming the nerves that arise from such interdisciplinary and interdependent conversations. Uh, I'm looking for, very much looking forward to hearing uh, Jeff's take on these uh, terms that we're going to have to think about later. And my contribution to this conversation is going to take the form of a report on an attempt to see what would happen if I tried to think these three terms in this conversation, endangerment, care, and the museum through my own fascination with noise. So it's a, 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 a report on an attempt uh, at putting noise in a museum. If I can share my uh, screen now. Hopefully that uh, brings up my PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Can I move my PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, okay, to that end, uh, this attempt to put noise in the museum, I want to distinguish at the outset of my talk between two types of noise. Uh, the first of which I want to suggest is, uh, first of which I want to suggest is already very much present in the museum, and the second of which leads to a more ambivalent understanding of the museum's role in mediating the relationship between stories of extinction and the politics of care. So the first type of noise, the noise that's already in the museum, is most easily thought of as the noise of media as it becomes obsolete. We call it medial noise. It's the type of noise discussed by Greg Hange in his article, Noistalgia, on the impossibility of recognizing noise in the present. An article where he dwells on the ways in which media and technology only become noisy as they are replaced by newer media and technology. So you can think the hiss of vinyl or the becoming vinyl of vinyl or the grain of the Polaroid or over and, over and under exposed photography, the clack of the typewriter, the roar of the modem, generally I suppose the marker of the analog in the era of the digital. And all of these are phenomena, Hange argues, which are altered in the presence of newer media and newer technologies, and they're suddenly perceived as indicative of obsolescence. So this form of noise means that these media and objects have been consigned to the past and have thus effectively taken up their place in the museum. And as the perceptual signifier of obsolescence, as an effective marker of extinction, I want to suggest that this type of noise functions as a kind of index, index or indexical sign of modernity. And the sense of modernity I'm invoking here is very much indebted to Arturo Escobar's idea of modernity as an ontoepistemological project as an episteme built around ideas of development, progress, and growth, whose distinguishing feature is the universalization of a particular ontology or cosmovision. This is modernity understood as a force which in its dedication to the creation of a one world world is dedicated to the displacement of alternative ontologies, either by banishing them from the realm of the real or consigning them to the past. 
And it's this relationship between medial noise as the perceptual marker of that process of displacement and the museum as the institutional space in which objects are consigned to the past that suggests we might think of the museum as the paradigmatic institute of modernity and interarchy. So that's to say that if I think along with Escobar, that medial noise identifies the museum as the institution that shapes and reproduces the idea of temporality upon which modernity as a tuned progress and development depends. Hence, while I can imagine modernity without schools or prisons or hospitals and shopping centers, and indeed I'm encouraged to do so, I cannot imagine modernity without museums because it's the institution of the museum at the time from which modernity derives its phenomenological form is sculpted and produced, which is to say that without the museum, there is no modernity. And insofar as the museum operates by consigning to the past those objects the modernity is deemed to have displaced, I can, in a certain sense, identify the core business of the museum as the production of extinction. Or no museum, no modernity, no modernity, no extinction. That may be too bold a thesis to extract from Escobar's argument, but he certainly encourages me to identify the kind of medial noise as a frequency of extinction. So it's a frequency or rate of extinction which might be measured in relation to other metrics of modernity, such as David Harvey's celebrated account of time space, space compression, a frequency of extinction directly keyed into the drive for immediacy. So this is my first type of noise, the type of noise which it seems is already omnipresent in the museum and which might in a certain sense be said to constitute the museum. The second type of noise through which I want to think the museum in relation to extinction and care is the kind of noise that presents itself as an interruption, a disturbance, a glitch, a distraction. It might be the fact that on the radio this morning, both the news presenter and the weather presenter were called Charles, a coincidence which interrupts whatever the two Charles's were talking about, as it suddenly aligns the British class system with global warming and news agendas. Noise is too many Charles. Or it might be the sirens in the street that interrupt the students' presentation on the dialectic of enlightenment. Noise is too many sirens. Or it might be a hesitation in the pronunciation of the plural of mongoose that reveals a connection between linguistic imperialism and the ecological monocultures, noise as too many mongooses. So this is the kind of noise that manifests itself as an interruption of an activity with which we were busy, uh, listening to the news, telling a story, thinking about enlightenment. But it's also the kind of noise that in its power to interrupt can force a sudden recognition of previously obscured relations or forms of relationality that produces a new form within familiar forms. So it's an interruption that has the potential to alter your perception of yourself or your relation to the world. It's thus noise that has a transformative potential. So annoyingly and paradoxically, this kind of noise is in a way also a signal. It's noise by virtue of its transformative power. It's noise which is extinguished in its perception. So, a provisional definition of the noise that I'm interested in here uh, might be noise as that which in forcing itself upon my attention has both altered by my attention and altered my attention or alters my capacity for attention. So there's an obvious problem with the idea of putting noise of this sort in the museum, namely that noise of this sort cannot be located or put anywhere. Noise in this sense cannot be sought it arrives, it announces itself, and it announces itself as an interruption of something else. It's the noise that only occurs when we are busy with something else. However, if the appearance of noise is always serendipitous and in its transformative power can be quite miraculous, then the growing body of theory uh, about noise is very helpful in telling me at least where it might be useful to wait for noise to put in an appearance where noise will and will not be found. And as far as a museum is in some sense a collection of objects, for example, 
and it seems likely that Claude Shannon could be a promising guy to find the noise. But the heart of Shannon's information theory is an idea that aligns noise directly with the principle of selection, namely that the information content of any message is derived as much from what is not said or could have been said as from what is actually said. But the selected is dependent for its information value on the unselected. And insofar as that unselected is a necessary condition of communication, it's a constant source of potential noise. So having this association of noise with the return of the unselected in mind, I shifted my attention from thinking about an abstract museum, the museum that Esquire helps me see as the paradigmatic institute of modernity, to an actual museum. This museum, or the museums assembled as the research center for material culture. Now, because of the thing that happened this year, it was, this was a museum I've come to know mainly through the search engine for its online catalog. Meeting a museum through its online catalog, that is without the filter of curation, a very important form of care, without selection and narration, I discovered is an overwhelming and overwhelmingly noisy experience. It's a direct encounter with the return of the unselected. And as Foucault and Escobar have taught us, the catalogue always tells us what something is, but never why it is included. Its principles of classification are derived from its faith in the describability of objects. And thinking about the principles of selection involved in the relationship between classification and description piqued my interest in categories uh, that seemed uneasy about the status of the objects they contained, which led me to the uh, slightly tortured category of producten neat for the locale mart, uh, or items not produced for the local market, which it seems turned out was a a noisy description or euphemism for tourist art. And this interest in items which trouble their descriptions led me in turn to this remarkable object. A Keichum canteen uh, dating from around 1880, which was purchased by the Dutch anthropologist uh, Herman Ten Carpen on the Yuma Indian Reservation in April 1883. And the catalog describes how Keichum women would sell items such as these to passengers on the train that stopped at the reservation four times a day. Now, there are many interesting things to say about the canteen, but I want to focus on the ways in which the extensive catalogue description, which is unusual in itself, subtly presents this marvellous object as the protagonist in a story of extinction. This canteen mm. is not, not what it seems. Firstly, the so-called canteen was entirely unfit for purpose. Uh, Cajun made canteens of unfired or low-fired clay that could not contain water. Filled, they simply melted away. Secondly, the Cajun themselves never used canteens and the form is borrowed from the metal canteens of settler culture. Sometimes uh, the origin of the form is evident, the catalogue writes. Uh, the canteen is a good example of a shape borrowed by many southwestern peoples. And thirdly, uh, the design, the catalogue records a sort of sense of disappointment that the design designs do not mean anything, but are simply imitative of local flora and fauna uh, in, in the catalogue. And although early anthropologists asked, they were unable to solicit any deeper significance or spiritual origin of these motifs. So this is a story about form as a loss of form, about tourist art as materializing the corruption and extinction of an indigenous culture. And this story about cultural extinction is borne out in the online biographies of Herman Ten Carter, who bequeathed the pot to the museum. Ten Carter, I learned, was particularly sensitive to the negative impact of Western society on indigenous cultures. According to the online biographies, his observations on the impact of whites on Indian cultures constitute valuable documentation of the dilution of native lifestyles. He held the view that the science of anthropology of non-Western cultures provided insight into deficiencies in Western culture. So Tenkata seems like a familiar romantic figure, the anthropologist as the connoisseur of extinction, who chronicles the corrupting influence of settler colonialism 
from indigenous cultures. And its acquisition of tourist art assumes its significance in relation to this process. So tourist art seems to be reiterating the story of extinction as a necessary consequence of the encounter with modernity that Escobar has prepared me to hear. It tells the story of modernity as predicated on the idea of extinction. But what then is the unselected in this fascination with extinction for which modernity reproduces itself? But it doesn't take much to recognize that as the protagonist of this story of extinction, this canteen is remarkably lively. It has made, after all, it's made its way from that railway platform to the museum and out of the vaults into an exhibition. It has an obvious power to generate words around itself in the catalog and now in this presentation. And two or three decades of cultural theory have taught us to attend to the agency of objects and to be wary of the covert operation of the universalism implicit in anthropocentric narrative. And that should be enough to remind me that the term tourist art constructs a conceptual model of mobility in which it is the tourist and by extension modernity that travels to the place of the indigenous who are forever tied to a place. A model of mobility that might distract me from appreciating the invention of the Cajun women who repurpose existing skills and practices to new ends, literally turning a pot inside out so that it no longer holds water, but now catches the gaze of passing railway travellers. Women who are already accessing the vector of modernity's aesthetic of extinction, already understand, understanding something about the nature of the souvenir. And given that the trope of extinction originates in biology, it seems legitimate to push this idea of lightning further into the biosemiotic realm and consider those patterns not as failed symbolic communication, but as a successful semiotic rule, a pattern whose meaning is performative, appealing to the eye in order to be taken up and carried away like seeds of the plants they may or may not depict. So it's easy enough to see how the canteen can function as the unselected in this extinction narrative. And if we are inclined uh, to read this pot as a counter story to modernity's narratives of extinction, it's a sp story with a strong denouement. But maybe the most fascinating fact about the Cajun canteen is that without it, we would have no idea of Cajun ceramics. For Cajun ceramics were traditionally cremated with their owners. The canteen, in other words, tells us a story of a radically alter modern temporality of self erasure, which can be heard only by virtue of its failure. And at this point, I think it's possible to link up this story of an ultra-modern temporality told by an unnamed woman on a railway platform in 1883 with more recent stories by women describing how the subjects lamented in narratives of extinction are predicated on the erasure of subjects that never get to become extinct. Stories like Zakai Eman Jackson becoming human with its brilliant analysis of how the species consciousness necessary to imagine extinction is inextricably bound up with the production of anti black racism. Or Dion Brand's dramatization in the novel The Fallen Change of the Moon of self erasure through mass suicide as the only response of enslaved bodies to those who extract profit from persistence. In other words, Thinking with the Cajun pot as the story of the unselected, an expression of how of the temporalities displaced and yet preserved by the discourse of extinction might allow us to think more carefully about what is at stake and the politics of care that are articulated around concerns with extinction. And here I want to conclude by turning very briefly to Ursula Heiser's discussion of that politics in her book imagining extinction, a book where she devotes much of her attention to the ways in which the politics of endangerment turns on questions of the distribution of care, what gets called endangered and what gets defended at the cost of what else. The politics of endangerment, in other words, is predicated on the assumption, the assumption that we should care about extinction or the impossibility of not caring about extinction. And when I try to make sense of figures about loss of biodiversity that elevate modernity to the level of an extinction event, I realize that it is my inability not to care about those figures, not to care about species loss, that places me 
and perhaps this model of noise inescapably in the museum. But I would hope that the uh, the Cajun plot uh, the Cajun plot would give us a way of uh, recognizing that a new politics of care begins with addressing our own investment in narratives of extinction. And that's uh, that's why I'd like to end. Thank you, Neil. Um, we're going to go to our second speaker, but before we do that, I just want to perhaps um, Neil ask you to hold on to that last statement that you make, that last statement about what might it mean, what might it demand of us in terms of caring for this politics of extinction within a framework of our museum, right? That demand that you ended with that pushes us to take this extinction of species life, interspecies life important in this present moment. And we're coming back to ask what is the role of the museum in that? But I want to also challenge you to think again around the question of tourist art, because I, 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 I was really fascinated by the ways in which you sketch another genealogy to the thinking of tourist art, objects that we in our museums very also very often used as a way of 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 showing or of yeah showing the agency of makers in in the work of the museum itself that not all art in museums not all objects in museums are um objects taken from ritual practices or taken from funerary um spaces but there were also um, a, a large, um, um, there is also a large body of work in our museums that also came with a sort of intentionality of this object being there for the purposes of the museum itself. Yeah. So I'm interested in that. And I know that some of our curators, including one of our own curators, Ahmed Schmidt in our museum has done extensive work on this. So it would be interesting um, to have that as a conversation. I want to turn now to our second speaker, Jeff Diamante. And Jeff is assistant professor in environmental humanities at the University of Amsterdam with Imra Zeman and Andrew Pedakis. He's co-author of the Bloomsbury Companion to Mark and with Amanda Butsek, he co-organized the At the Moren and an ongoing research project on the political ecology of glacial retreats in Greenland with um, Lynn B B Bedia and Maria um, Setinit. He is co-author of, of the Climate Realism book and, and journal collection. His first book, Climate and Capital in the Age of Petroleum, Locating Terminal Landscape is forthcoming with Bloomsbury. And actually one of the things that I really like about Jeff's um, biography is how it emphasizes a practice of collaboration. There is in all of his work, this practice of doing things with. And it is exactly that, that we want to emphasize in the work that we do here in our museum, a conversation about a witness as we try to um, create different more equitable futures. Jeff, I turn over to you and thanks already for your presentation. Thank you, Wayne. And and thank you, Alessandra and Juliet and Neil, of course, for those wonderful comments. I'm positively giddy to be here. I'm uh, I've I've been long fascinated by the work of this of this center and and endlessly inspired by it. And so have my students. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my screen to get started. I have about 21 minutes of things to say. Um, I'll just get started. Our weather in Western Europe is among other things, the result of what happens when currents carrying warm water from the Caribbean mixes with Arctic currents 3,000 kilometers northwest of here. Oceanographers term this circulatory system the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC. And it, Americans call it the Gulf Stream. And it's the aim of my short remarks today to help bring AMOC into focus for critical curatorial discourse. Because the ocean is opaque to electromagnetic waves, which means satellite sensors cannot probe beyond the surface of the seas, ocean currents and depths are predominantly measured and monitored, not by, taking, not by looking at them, but by listening 
Acoustic waves uh, that make up the soundscapes of the sea get read by acoustic Doppler current profilers. By reading not current itself, but, but, but by reading the particulate tracers carried by flow. So you can't see current and you can't hear current. And that's because it's a medium. It's not an object. You can only hear the signaling of particulate matters, drifting minerals, plankton. Current is noise that comes into focus through interference. From the standpoint of the soundscape of the ocean currents, we'd have to say that the shifting force, direction, and consequences of currents come into focus through the distortions of currents. The materials, stuff, and densities that mark the hydrosphere as both lively and archival. As an archive, and as all archives are, the soundscape of the sea is also proleptic, a read on the shape of things to come. What if we took the technical study of shifting ocean currents in the field and lab as an unfinished epistemic project? One that admits, as it does, uncertainty and interpretive hubris, and therefore a gathering of cultural perspectives. Current solicits dozens of labs and disciplines to measure and translate. But because, both because the ocean resists easy translation into data, it's really big, and also the more we know about it, the more complex it appears, and because currents are forced by impossibly large inputs like planetary gravitation, abyssal shelves, thermal relations, salinity, density, horizontal deep flow, carrying nearly freezing waters from pole to pole under the seas, and of course, history itself. The currents are world making and they unnerve the normative frame of the nation state as the envelope of meaning making. As a non-geocentric concept, current can force our notion of care out into turbulent waters. And since it requires a sort of interdisciplinary apparatus to read its noise and feel its futures, to read how it is written and how it writes itself back into political ecology, there's no good reason why the arts and, and, and the particular epistemic instruments and concepts of the ethnographic museum should not be part of that interpretive effort. The currents carrying warm, moist air the currents carrying war warm, moist air from the Caribbean to Western Europe came into focus as an object of study for oceanographers in the post-war era. But it was not until the last three or four years that it became what Bruno Latour calls an object of concern, marked by a flurry of new initiatives, labs, earth science publications, and mainstream media attention peaking in 2018. Why would North American and European earth scientists, the business public, and insurance companies suddenly get anxious about deep sea physics and chemistry. Because as the peculiar dynamics of deep horizontal flows of cold polar waters beneath the Atlantic circulatory system began to explain why the North Atlantic in particular is so uncharacteristically warm and active, given its relative latitude in relation to the equator, oceanographers began as well to note that the AMOC is already at its weakest that it's been in the past 1600 years. In the next 100 years, the currents could be as much as 30% weaker than they were in the middle of the 20th century, or they could shift course entirely. The same currents that created the unique precipitation and thermal profile of colonialism's core, and that's what you're looking at here, and carried seaborne trade in the form of minerals, commodities, and of course, enslaved peoples across the Middle Passage are in the near future going to radically and almost unpredictably alter the livability of those same centers. Becoming subject to the elemental force of radically altered currents is a very different kind of problem from the problem of rising seas, both for our concepts of resilience and sustainability, but also the terms by which we understand the anthropogenesis of climate change and the modes by which the seas hold and animate history in the language of currents. I'll come back to this point at the end. Today, what I wanna do is simply make a distinction and then to gesture towards some of the ways that this distinction might matter for how we conceive of, but also phrase our sense of taking care. The distinction I wanna make is between two lexicons or groups of terms and concepts and dynamics around which this thing called the human 
has been positioned in relation to the complex ecological dynamics mixing and intensifying amidst climate change. The first lexicon or group of terms is geological. Um, a range of social scientists, humanists, chemists, and geologists have been theorizing the genesis or founding premise of global warming through the language of the human's geological agency. The second lexicon is hydrological. And while it is less common and popular in theoretical uh, discourses of climate, I want to propose that it provides a different curatorial and critical idiom through which to think the complexities of human and inhuman histories. So one, geolo from geology to hydrology. The grammar around which the Anthropocene has been understood since Paul Crutzen and Eugene Stormer's important article in 2000 involves the redefinition of the human as a, quote, geological force. Extractive industries have long, been dis have long disrupted the solid mass of the Earth's surface and what lies beneath it. But terming the, the human a geological force turns that activity into a planetary principle. Not like a geological force. The simile would simply compare the scale of human history to the tectonics of the Earth. In the words of Deepesh Chakrabarty, the human has become, has quote, become a geological agent, unquote. Now this phrasing means two things at once. First, that the human has at scale the power to alter the geological strata of the earth. This means that bios and geos, two terms that classically mark the boundaries of the life and non-life distinction for the human and earth sciences, have to be reconceived. But second, it means that the, that human agency, again at the scale of the species, is grammatically and materially contingent on its facility with geological forces and affordances. The qualifier geological in the sentence is more than a predicate. It blurs the stable position of the sentence's subject, the human, because the equivocation named in the verb to be portends a geologic in the very category of human agency. And we could put this a little easier and say that in its current configuration, as a creature formed in fossil fueled modernity, the figure of the human is either with or without agency in the measure that it has ongoing access to geological forces. And that's a little bit different than saying that human history leaves a mark in the ground. Now, this is the founding grammar of the Anthropocene discourse. The scene in question is, of course, the rung on the geological timescale. It troubles our inherited concept of the human as a subject of reason and the agent overcoming necessity through freedom, the agent that is of classical history. If the becoming geological of the human came without consequence, if there was nothing at stake except for more and more freedom, then the story of human history marching progressively toward what Francis Fukuyama termed the ends of man might still capture the imagination. In 1991, when he made this, uh, when he published this book, it maybe made a bit of sense, this fiction of triumphalist progress. It is a fiction in which neither the left nor the right puts much stock today, however because we are in the thick of new stories and new fictions, and they are profoundly tragic. The story implied by the characterization of this ontological qualification of, the, of, human, of, the, uh, of to be geological is in the thick of the ecological tipping points that we are in to be in a tragedy of our own making. Now, I'm not saying here that the genre of tragedy is therefore befitting the genres of collective struggle upon us today. I don't think that necessarily. Instead, what I'm trying to point out is that the geological paradigm does, does carry us back to the grounds of modernity, where blood and sweat and the enslaved body toils in the mine, where geos is subject to the white settler structures of sovereignty a violent and still disavowed genesis to all manner of wealth accumulation across the centers of capital. And this is a tragedy because of the unspeakable forms of inhuman origins and ends portended by geological subjection, or what Catherine Yusuf calls the materialization of blackness as a mineral resource in the plantation and the forms of extractive labor to which enslaved bodies were pressed. She says, the slave, quote, and, and the mineral were recognized in regimes of value, but not, not only so much as they await extraction, 
where whiteness is the arbiter and owner of value, unquote. And it's the ongoing forms of surplus generation from both racialized labor regimes and extractive industries, both mineralogical and hydrocarbon, that trap our present in the geological distinction between sovereign, white subject, and inhuman standing reserve of value. In Yusuf's, Yusuf's account, we are choking not on the exhaust of the human as such, but on what she calls the dust of a billion black Anthropocenes. The tragedy uh, quietly morphs into horror, and I would say that it asks for rage and not care. That's the story of the becoming geological of the human. And constructing new narratives about sustainable futures in that same paradigm does more to efface and invisibilize the originary and ongoing violence of radical and racialized inequalities than it does to redress those violences. And it's a story that rings true when we look around at the ground upon which we stand. Because reason, even critical reason, takes the ground as its footing. As bipedal landbound creatures of thought, the geological story of modern subjectivity requires a bit of metaphor, but not a lot. Of course, the figure of the modern subject subjects its ground in the struggle for freedom over necessity. But that story has to break on the shoreline of modernity's edge, the interface of land and water, where geology leaches and erodes into the, hydro, into the hydrosphere, where the elemental force of oceanic and historical currents turn sturdy grounds spectral. The shift to a hydrological paradigm involves yielding to instead of wielding elemental forces. It involves becoming subjects to the sea, my title for today because it's more difficult to stand on the hydrosphere, let alone bend it to white liberal subjecthood. Rheology is the study of the fluid dynamics of liquid and solid shapes passing into viscous relation. How, for instance, jello or honey or petroleum or melting ice sheets moves across surfaces and crevices. T Tiffany Lethabo King in a, in a very new book uh, ends the Black Shoals, the title of her book with a call to quote, drag liberal humanist and post-humanist discourses of freedom to the shoals to contend with black and native demands that man, big M man, give an account of its violence. The shoal figured in her book's title is an important boundary object between the geosphere and the hydrosphere that I'm asking us to consider today, where navigation of the sea slows at the rocky and porous interlude between stable shores um, which conclude the vessel's uh, journey and tra where, where trade can commence. The shoal names, quote, elements of the ocean that are not stable or readily mappable and therefore knowable, unquote. As a figure, the shoal is as much geological as it is hydrological. And by dragging white liberal thought to that interface and epistemological uncertainty, King means as well to keep the formative space of the ocean and its passage in black studies alive to current studies of and efforts for abolition and decolonization. From Hortense Spiller's Oceanic Suspension and Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic to Edouard Glissant's Poetics of Relation Between Land and Sea, King summarizes, quote, while often evoking a space of connection, transit, passage, and flow the ocean has also functioned as a complex seascape and ecology within Black diaspora studies that ruptures normative thought and European discourse. Two, AMOC. The turn to water in the humanities and social sciences has been precipitated by critical race and feminist materialists for the, for the past few decades. Scholars like Christina Sharp, Astrid Naminas, and Stacia Limo have returned discourses of embodiment and environmental relation to the metaphors and materialities of our salty and fluid constitutions as bodies. I've been inspired by this hydrological pivot away from the geological, but what I want to introduce as a possible case study around which to populate the distinction I began with is an example of how thinking political ecology from the seas brings together oceanic and historical currents in disturbing ways. The Atlantic is, is unique compared to other oceans in that heat transfer moves northward from the south of the equator instead of dissipating to the two poles. 
a thermal circulation that's been largely responsible for the particular chronotope of European colonialism and the early stages of capitalism. Trade winds, departure times, sea sailborne cargo. The AMOC depends on the subpolar gyre south of Greenland, which you see at the top left of the map there, and its thermal differentiation. Usually, what should happen is that warm water forces cold back to the bottom of the ocean, where it gets transported back south towards Antarctica along the ocean abyss, which is the bottom of the ocean, or basically anything under uh, 1,000 meters. Um, a unique physical dynamic called the Ekman pumping at points of pronounced differential between hot and cold, or upwelling, pumps up nutrients and sediment from the abyssal highway back to the surface and creates a unique basin of ongoing bloom for krill and whales and birds and plankton. We used to think that the Gulf Stream was the singular current, swirling air and water in an easterly pattern. Uh, from the 18th century onwards, navigators understood the Gulf Stream as a, basically a, a singular current of basically you know, hot, warm air moving from the, from the tropics up towards Western Europe. Um, but now we know that the Gulf Current moves in that direction because of the abyssal flow of cold Arctic waters under the warm current keeping the warmth and moisture suspended and concentrated in what ocean oceanographers call the mixed layers of the sea. Currents, therefore, interact. The slowdown of this thermohaline circulation is at about 15 to 20% since the Industrial Revolution. In, in, pa in the past, alterations of this magnitude to Earth systems typically trigger uh, what's called a Dansgaard Oschger event, or violent and rapid oscillations in currents and thermal circulation, which have only happened 25 times in Earth's geo and cryophysical record. In this instance, the convection collapse, by more than a few estimations, will mean long and cold winters in Western Europe because the hot Gulf waters won't travel or overturn, and impossibly hot and stormy summers on the east coast of the US down to the Caribbean. Weather will move like mud. It will very slowly circulate. And the steady supply of warmth from the Caribbean will turn off, leaving Europe paradoxically in the outer extremes of hot and cold, well outside of the temperate median that lubricated the long arc of its wealth accumulation. Last paragraph. It's profoundly weird to encounter in journals of oceanography and earth sciences the language of empire and colonialism, bound up with the empirical study of shifting currents. A 2019 issue of Journal of Ocean and Climate, for instance, includes the riveting conclusion that, quote, the region that initiated the Industrial Revolution and its transfer of carbon to the atmosphere may lose the regular moderate rainfall that seemingly facilitated its prosperity and power. The oceans have thus influenced human cultural development in the North Atlantic region in the past and may influence human cultural development in the future." Unquote. Environmental determinism of imperial power aside, which is a problem that its author goes to great lengths to qualify, ocean currents are here in this discourse carrying more than one kind of signal and more than one kind of noise. The shorthanded history named by, quote, human cultural development in the North Atlantic region includes the whispers of capital's historical dependence on extractive relations to land and labor, now weighing on the present, not just as black carbon in the air we breathe, but also deep down in the ocean abyss. An abyss that is getting thick and resistant to the currents of history unfolding unabated. From both an epistemic and ecological standpoint, the currents carry noise. And the uncomfortable leap from the instruments measuring current to the labs from which models confer a picture of the whole onto a future coded in collapse to the inclusion of imperial and colonial power in the story that makes sense of, the dis of this distortion between uh, the lab and the field is another kind of signal. This, this interpretive scramble I'm, 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 I wanna emphasize, I'm saying is another kind of signal that the hydrological paradigm requires narratives, not about the wielding of geos by a universal figure of the sovereign human, but instead narratives about yielding to the force of the seas. Reading and telling stories from within the hydrological means bringing the buried and drifting histories of the present into focus, 
not in a narrative arc that concludes with the becoming geological of the human, but of all the elemental noise that prefigures the unraveling of that human. Thank you. Um, thank you, Neil. And we're going to, I think I can start now. Neil, are you there? Um, I want to start. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. I want to start. We have we have yeah a little bit more than 15, 20 minutes to in, in our conversation, and I or we have less, but we have we're going to push it a little bit. And I, I'm very interested to tie both of your work. Actually, as you finished, Jeff, you went back to the question of noise, and um, and it is interesting how the, that overlaps with a conversation around the question of noise, and reminds me of one of our other collaborative partners, Tina Kemp, um, where she speaks about the question of listening and reverberation, and what is at stake with 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 with, with listening to images she calls. At the outset, though, I want to ask a question, perhaps to start out with Jeff, because you, you made an intriguing point when you suggested that perhaps, which is a critical point, perhaps, of us, and a good critical point, eh? perhaps in quoting um, Yusuf's book, you speak about the relationship between rage and care and what is demanded of the present in relationship to um, 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 that. The, the, the histories that we are attending to. And I wonder if you could tease out a little bit that relationship more and, and, and how do we as institutions um, address these two? Um, sometimes one could think of them as disparate um, contrapuntual entities, right? Rage and care, especially at a moment when our institutions are em em embroiled in what many would find a moment of rage, a moment of rage against us, um, a moment of rage of, of our inability to change and those kinds of questions. So what is your thinking about that relationship between the demand for rage and the demand for care within our framework? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lovely question to think with, though I feel a little bit ill-equipped to speak about how this might translate into practice in the museum. The answer to the question is really sort of in my pivot from one critical paradigm through which we tell the story of the present in ecological terms, namely the geological and a switch to the hydrological. But I can tease that out a bit. And I like that you pointed to the contrapuntal, Wayne, because that's exactly how in my own thinking I've been trying to treat the ways in which we need to start thinking about the sort of narrative texture by which something like what happens in Greenland which is a story about Inuit sovereignty, which is a story about Danish and European colonialism, but is also a story about the cryosphere, a specific material entity and process and dynamic in relation to what happens in other places in the world, like the Pacific Islands or the Caribbean, right? And the contrapuntal is exactly how I've been trying through Glissant and Edward Said, I've been trying to think about how to pull these places and dynamics into relation that don't fall either into the critical vocabulary around which the geological human has been constructed, even when it's trying to be, even, even as, in, as is the case with, with Yusuf's uh, book, to a certain extent with, with Chakrabarti, even when it's an attempt to sort of disarticulate that conjunction or to point to its limits. So on the one hand that, and on the other hand, the kind of God's eye view of satellite imagery that I, that I find populates many of the, the, the ways in which sort of climate comes into focus through earth science discourses, right? And so the contrapuntal is a, is a demand really, right? It's an interpretive demand on researchers, on curators to put things together in ways that don't necessarily line up seamlessly within the existing narrative structures by which we tell the story of the present. I think Neil was sort of talking about this too, right? Like, um, you know, the contrapuntal is like both a method to bring relation into focus at awkward angles, but is also already embedded in the in the museum. I think this was one of this is one of the things I took from from Neil's wonderful reading of uh, of that of that object, is that 
you can read the object back against its discourse, of course. And so, so I guess for the time being, I mean, I take my students to the Tropa Museum every year. And whenever I take them, it's always, we always have a similar kind of conversation, which is that the Tropa Museum, I haven't been to the others in, in the Netherlands, I have to admit, but there at least you're always confronted with a kind of dissonance, right? And it's obviously deliberate. The, curator, the curatorial voice is constantly undermining itself in the way that it narrates the objects on view. And some people probably find that really frustrating, but of course, like our students are, are enlivened by that because it opens an interpretive space where all of a sudden, you know, how an object arrived at the museum and who stole it from who and what it means in the present and so on are all on the table for thinking as opposed to a kind of passive, you know, a passive audience that moves through and sort of awes at whatever, like the distinction between the historical moment in which the object was produced and our current moment when we look at it with this sort of curiosity. So dissonance and the contrapuntal, I think, are two way, two sort of ethics that are incumbent upon not just the curators that we are talking with today, but also as researchers as well and as activists, I think. But it's but I'll just say the last thing quick is I think it it is always going to frustrate the the ways in which you know, we did, I think we often desire sort of clean narratives that get us from point A to point B. And the noise and the particulate matter that gets in the way of that clean narrative, I think paying attention to it and listening to it and staging an encounter with it in new ways is maybe one way to move forward. I'll stop there. Well, I, I mean, I really appreciate that as well, but for several other reasons, you know, over the course of the last two days, the questions of the relational, have come up and up again, and 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 what? How do we think in in terms of relationality, and also through the work of Glissant? So I was also, you know, with my own interest in Caribbean thought, um, um, very excited by your move towards the ocean, and the question of the ocean that emerges in many Caribbean thinkers from Glissant, but also um, Derek Walcott, so others who have been thinking through the ocean as connectivity, as relationality, and actually. It brings me to, and perhaps you can reflect on this later on, that what we think is an amazing film of spoken word, um, mm -hmm. contrapuntality <laughs> between um, um, two um, indigenous um, spoken word artists, one of whom is in our museum, Kathy Jetnell, and her work to try and think through what is at stake in the, in the, 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 the coterminous at stake in the, the melting of the ice with what happens in the Marshall Islands, right? And, and so we, we could reflect on that later on as exactly, precisely bringing together these different, what some people might think of as disparate spaces in a kind of language together to try and help us understand the precarity. So we can come back. Wait, can I say something? <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to say, I'm so glad you brought up that, that poem. It's called Rise, the initial yeah. poem that she wrote with Aka Navinia. And it's when I saw that poem while I was doing research in Greenland that I thought, oh my God, the contrapuntal. Right, right, right. But it is, I mean, that was, that made, uh, you know, for us, and we've been trying also to get her here as a, as a fellow as well for, for a while now, and our colleague Bruno Vez, who I know is online, um, um, is, um, is really interested in her work, so in Kathy's work. So um, that kind of language is something that I think we should think through a little bit further, because yesterday we also spoke about the relationship, not, not necessarily to think geography in, in, its, in the sense of how ethnographic museums are invested in Africa as a geography or wherever, but also to think through territoriality and the relationship between territoriality and extinction, the relationship between territoriality and, and extraction and what it, what it means, because the notion of territoriality brings in a certain kind of decolonial perspective sometimes that the notion of geography doesn't in certain sense. And I think that that is something that came up recently. But, but for you, uh, Neil, I was interested very much in that so I want to end with you with talking about this question of attending to extinction. But before that, I want to get into, again, this question of the sonic, of listening, of sound, of noise, by asking you about this notion of interruption and how might interruption, how do you, that theorizing of interruption 
as a noise that 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 could perhaps help us to 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 care better to care otherwise but also to think differently about the project of the museum can you just expound on that a little bit for us interruption <clears throat> uh yes i mean i i think i'd i'd, 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 want, I'd want to uh to start by saying that I, 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 can't, I can't formulate a sort of a, an idea of care which isn't predicated on interruption, right. is where, is where, I, where I, I ended up. Yeah. Care seemed, seemed like um, an immensely suspicious uh, uh, category or activity in most, uh, in, mo in most of the sort of the theorizations mm -hmm. of care uh, that I read into in preparation for this, uh, for this talk. This, this, there always seem to be a, a problem. There's the sort of idea of care as reciprocity, which starts from a positionality of, a, of, a, of the subject, which is fulfilled through the act of care. So presumes the existence of that subject uh, prior to care. And then there's uh, Joan Tronto's idea of care as a species activity. Yeah. Yeah. And it's precisely the category of the species which I'm tying to this uh, problematic of extinction. So thinking thinking of care as a sort of self-maintaining, uh, a, a practice of maintaining an entity already takes us into that sort of uh, uh, investment of what is, the, what is the count of extinction and what is uncounted when we count in that way. So the problem of care was, was sort of where I started from to think about uh, what's, what's the, What's the problem if we can only think about endangerment and ecological care if we assume a care for extinction as taken as a given? Right. So it's the need to have that uh, narrative and investment in, in extinction interrupted in some form, maybe by this pot, maybe by uh, the work of, uh, of, scho of, of scholars like uh, Sukai Iman Jackson, before we can start thinking about uh, care, was the uh, was the position that I that, uh, that, I, that I departed from, I think. Right. But it also led me into the position where, as I realise, I cannot not care about extinction. Therefore, I realise that uh, my caring is a form of addiction. And uh, then I'd want to think probably more in Jeff's terms about how the bod body that cannot not care is formed within those sort of uh, those contrapuntal relationships, those uh, system relationships, those climatic systems uh, as a sort of direct consequence. So that, that's that's where that's where I'd, I'd link into uh, Jeff's uh, account of uh, the current and noise, the yeah. current will interrupt us. I want to. Uh, I I want to perhaps ask you both to ask each other or respond to each other. But before I do that, one of the things that you both do, and you mobilize um, a large body of, especially, um, which is important to our own work here, um, Black and Indigenous feminist thoughts. So, you know, in many ways, you know, when I see the work that you're doing, I mean, from um, Black Shoals as a, as a book to, um, and if you were to read Catherine Yusuf's work, which is based in a lot on, on, on black, feminist, black feminism, or you, you go to Christina Sharp's work, but there is a lot working there. And Tiffany King is also trying to bring together in a more recent book that she wrote, she co-edited called Otherwise Worlds, has been trying to bring together that um, black and indigenous feminisms of, of thinking to try and imagine other worlds. So one of the things that I would love to ask of you both is, um, in what ways, you know, what, and, and also we went back to, 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 to Arturo Escobar's two reversal worlds. So in, in what is at stake for you in our own museums, our institutions, investing in that kind of reading of its collections, um, Neil, you were more co collections oriented. And, and what is the critical yield to be gained for a curatorial strategy that is invested is in Black, Indigenous, and feminist thinking? What do you think we can be gained from that? I'm sorry to put you under pressure to answer <laughs> that, but go ahead and speculate for us. 
Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know how. Okay, so my, so my argument is about uh, the seeing 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 the museum as a repository of pluriversal histories. I suppose that's a very sort of simple gospel. How do you articulate those uh, those pluriversal histories? By well, the, the practical exact answer is giving giving uh, many more items within that catalogue that is. You know, sort of usually a, a very minimal description, a sort of a, a, an, an alter modern narrative, perhaps. Make make the catalogue a resource for uh, alter modern narratives of temporality. Explore the sort of uh, explore the histories that are masked in our obsession with extinction, uh, the pathos of extinction. Uh, you know that 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 narrative that's so familiar, but I'd also. Uh, you know, I ended up thinking I'd gone on completely the wrong idea talking about a single pot. What I should have talked about in, in my encounter with the catalogue was the, uh, the the thousands of uh, of black and white photos of plantations, you know, sort of none of which are different from any of the others, uh, but seem to have to be in the museum, even though there's no process of selection involved. So it's just, just like this sort of uh, compulsion to gather these sort of documents of modernity into itself. I'd like to see a sort of a, a narration about that sort of uh, compulsion to document the onset of modernity consuming itself, I think would be a sort of a, a nice, uh, a nice alter modern narrative. Okay. Neil, um, thank you, Neil. I, I mean, I, 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 I must admit a, 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 a excitement with the reading that you did of the catalog. For another reason as well, I mean, primarily from our perspective that we've been investing more in our catalog, but also because there is a way in which it presumes a, a, a valuation of the other forms of work that curators and museums can do beyond the exhibitionary, right? There's a way in which the exhibitionary is the, is the investment that we, 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 we spend our time with and, and not other spaces. So I, I really appreciate that. Yes. Um, my last question um, to you, and in a way, I, I, I can't remember if I, because I have my notes mess, messed up here. The genre of tragedy, was it you who spoke of that? Yes, the genre of tragedy, and your push for or against the genre of tragedy, because there is a way in which tragedy is embedded in, the, in, in a conceptual argument that even the question of extinction will enable, right? The question I've seen is a tragic argument. And my interest would be to ask the question, perhaps differently by, is it so that you're proposing that the hydrological um, takes us out of that genre of tragedy? And if that is the case, what is the hope that, that moving, while not negating tragedy, what is the hope that we can hold on to for using these collections to narrate other sorts of stories that are not um, centered on the genre of tragedy? I mean, I, I, I could try that. It's a nice question, but it already embeds the claim in it. But it's beautiful, as is everything you say, Wayne. Um, okay, the, tr the 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 narrative structure of tragedy. I'm I'm talking about the same kind of problem that Macarena was talking about yesterday in her opening remarks about Amitav Ghosh and the Great Derangement. Yeah. In that book, The Great Derangement, Ghosh makes the claim that we are living in a tragedy and we lack the cultural form to produce what in Aristotelian terms would be the kind of recognition that we are the agent of our own in tr tragic in, in, in plotment, right? So we keep on just like producing the same kinds of narratives of progress and sustainability and overcoming using exactly the same kind of concepts of agency in relation to passive res resources and so on. And that, that, you know, that codes the future in the terms of the present. That's the tragedy. There's no break. There's no moment of recognition. Um, and my claim was like the geological paradigm of thinking the human as a, as, a, as a force on earth is a necessary moment in critique because we have to recognize the fossil fueled nature of modernity and the kind of buried and sedimented histories that are piling up into the present as detritus and as whisper and as, and as particulate matter. But it doesn't get us to the point you're asking. I think the hydrological does get us there 
because you can't wield the oceans in the same manner as a kind of planetary force that you can the geological sphere. And when I say we, I basically mean like the shitheads who run Shell and BP, right? And the ways in which like our infrastructural embeddedness in everyday life is completely bound up and, and dependent on those structures reproducing themselves in the future, right? The hydrological can't do that. I know you can build dams. I know you can turn you know, water into resource. And we do that all the time, but the current not, not, it, it can't be altered in the same way. It instead is altered as a consequence of all of these different forces congealing through planetary forces and in turn altering what the future will look like for the same figure of, you know, geological human on land. So there's a way in which I, I like this idea that uh, yielding to elemental forces as opposed to trying to wield them produces a very different sense of ecological and political relationality. Right. And this gets back to the question you're just asking, Neil, that's a that's a sense of relationality that I didn't know until I spent lots and lots of time, not enough time, but lots and lots of time in critical race and indigenous studies. That's a, and, and more. And, and actually, the moment that I felt it and wanted to think more about it was actually the novel that Neil pointed out by Dion Brand. Right. The first couple of uh, uh, chapters of that book lead us to the progeny of the woman who had, who initially um uh, incites this mass suicide. And there's a, there's a sense of like the shore and the ocean and the whales and the sounds of the sea that basically become, uh, that, that in that book by Dion Brand at the full and half change of the moon, I think it's called, um, it, it gives you a sense that world making doesn't always have to be a, like, uh, embedded in suffocating existing worlds, but it can actually be like an entangled relation or ethic in relation to the forces that exist at this interface of land and sea, right? And that gave me a totally different sense of the politics and ecology of critical race and indigenous studies that have since I've been trying to build into my, my, my idioms and my, my modes of telling stories. Um, and I think it, you know, the hydrological is central to that. And it's an, it, the hydrological is an interruption of the kinds of stories we tell when we're standing on land. And I want to, I need to close now because we're running out of time, but if anything else, um, I, I like the way you end. Because in a way, one of the things that we are trying to do as ethnographic museum is to try to attend to the geological of tragedy, of the tragic, but at the same time, still find the possibility of hope to imagine. And if the hydrological does that, if, the, if critical race theory helps us to do that, that is something that I think we, 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 we need as institutions. Um, and the question is, it is in that tense relationship between understanding and accepting the catastrophic histories of which we are a part, but still being invested in an idea that certain other futures are possible, imagining other worlds are possible, and that the ethnographic museum can be a site from which that happens. I want to thank you both. Um, I want to thank everybody who is still online, and I want to welcome the persons who are still online to join us again at three o'clock as when we have um, Professor Rosalind Morris, who has been thinking with us for a long time now about questions of extraction, um, um, in another conversation with them. Thank you. Until later. Thank you both. All right. Thank you.